Welcome to Eye on America. I'm Michelle Miller. Today we tour the country bringing you stories of tech forward solutions to persistent problems. In Illinois, we tune into bipartisan efforts to keep AM radio on the airwaves. And in Massachusetts, we see how grazing sheep are part of a unique partnership that's boosting sustainability. But we begin with a broadband battle. More than 8 million American homes and businesses do not have access to high-speed internet. Weija Jang heads to West Virginia, where the government is pushing to build a better connection. This may be the, the best that it gets. When Amanda Moore can't get on the web. It's not responding. She doesn't just reset her router or modem like many of us would. Moore takes her laptop for a ride up the hill behind her house on the hunt for a hot spot. It's kind of like you share your favorite place to shop. We share our favorite places to get signal. Moore lives in Clay County, West Virginia, a state where the FCC estimates about a third of homes and businesses do not have high speed broadband access. While she now often works from home for the United Way, Moore was a professional photographer for 20 years. Not having the bandwidth to upload files turned out to be much more than an inconvenience. It sounds like it altered your career path. It did. It absolutely altered my career path. I didn't have the time to wait for the infrastructure to catch up to you know, the business that we wanted to have, so I just had to let it go. Broadband isn't a luxury anymore. It's a necessity. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo is leading the Biden administration's $65 billion broadband push as part of the bipartisan infrastructure law signed in 2021. Bravo. Working to make it universally available in about five years, Ramondo's broader mission is maintaining America's competitiveness with China. She says internet access is critical. It's really essential um, to our competition. So are we at a disadvantage right now? Tapping into everyone in America, boys, girls, people of color, people living in rural America, will make us stronger. And if those are the people who don't have the internet, we're losing out on their talent. Talent, like 15-year-old Jaylee Persinger. I really like this one. I like that one pretty. too. Who does not have broadband at her house in Heiko, West Virginia. How does the lack of fast service impact your schoolwork at home? Well, it, make, it makes it very hard. It takes me about like a minute to five minutes to like reconnect. And by that time, with my ADHD, I'm like, okay, is this even like worth doing? Did you hear on time today? Yeah. a boy. Jaylee's principal, Richard Pettit, says some students can't connect to the internet at all. We have a lot of kids that live up um, in the back hollers of, of the area that just doesn't have the option or they can't afford it at home. If we don't do something to address the gap, we can only determine that we're gonna leave people behind. West Virginia, along with every other state, will receive federal funding to expand broadband access. But even with the influx of cash, it may still be a long road. The biggest challenge is topography. So you think about some places out in the West or, or anywhere really with mountain ranges, with difficult physical circumstances, but we will get it done. For Amanda Moore, it can't get done soon enough. Would broadband access make your life better? Broadband access would make me probably sing and dance and <laughs> yeah, it would make my life easier. It would make everybody's life a lot easier. Continuing now with the digital divide, more and more new cars are being sold without the ability to receive AM radio signals. Chris Van Cleve finds out why this is a rising safety concern and looks into efforts to reverse it. As you approach the McCluggage Bridge. For nearly 100 years, WMBD has been covering and talking about the news in central Illinois from 1470 on the AM dial. But not anymore for drivers of a number of new electric vehicles. A host of automakers have pulled AM radio tuners from their cars, saying the EV batteries can interfere with reception. It's no coincidence that the first two letters of America are AM. They've been around a long time. Greg Batten is the Greg in the Dan and Greg show, heard mornings on WMBD for nearly 20 years. I'm not worried that we can't adapt to those changes, 
But it doesn't help when you yank away a few million radios and say, well, those folks can't listen to you ever. He was there when a vicious EF4 tornado tore a 46-mile path through Washington County, Illinois, killing three and injuring 125, while causing 800 million in damage and sending debris as far as Chicago. We were immediately on the air and stayed on the air nonstop for days. There are nearly 4,500 AM radio stations across the country, heard by about 82 million people a week. The AM signal tends to reach further than FM radio, often stretching deep into rural America. It is typically home to news and talk radio. If you take away the AM radio from cars, what does that do to your business? The quick answer is, I mean, it could be disastrous to our business, no question. During a hearing on Capitol Hill, the first responders argued AM radio serves as the backbone of the nation's emergency alert system. Our belief is that AM radio is a critical source of information to our citizens during a crisis. When disaster strikes, no one should lose access to this essential information because the vehicle being driven does not have AM radio. Our members view um, that there are more options for delivering content and alerts now in vehicles than there ever were. Scott Schmidt from the Trade Association representing automakers told Congress the vast majority of cars still have AM radio and the decision to pull it from some EVs was not made lightly. This has been something that manufacturers look at customer preferences very closely and so they do a lot of market research and try to determine what, how to deliver the most value to the customers. But that drive to tune out AM radio is prompting unusual bipartisan agreement between the very liberal Senator Ed Markey and the very conservative Senator Ted Cruz. You know, it, I, I'm pretty sure that's a, one of the signs of the apocalypse. Kidding aside, they are now co-sponsoring a bill to require AM radio stay in vehicles. If Elon Musk can brag that he can send rockets into space, that he should be able to figure out how to keep AM radio in passenger vehicles. AM radio is, is, is the lifeline to people who are in crisis, so it's an integral part of keeping Americans safe. While automakers call the proposed legislation distinctly non-essential, Ford reversed course, dropping plans to remove AM radio from all its new vehicles and will return it to all 2023 EVs. Ford's Donna Dixon is the lead engineer for the electric Mustang Mach-E. We talked and listened to our customers. Just the customers telling us, hey, there's some emergency broadcast frequencies that still aren't available. It's important to us. We said, OK, we got it. We turned it back on. Why take it out at all? It seems like it's not broke, don't fix it kind of problem. And we'll continue to watch it as we go forward to make sure that it's available. At a charging station in Gilman, Illinois, an hour outside of Peoria, Mach-E owner Keith Rice is glad to hear it's staying. I just think there's too many things on AM radio that people still use. WMBD. Something that's never far from Greg Batten's mind whenever that on-air light turns red. Coming up, a new threat to an iconic American fruit. This is Eye on America. Georgia is known as the peach state, producing more than 130 million pounds of the fruit every year. But an unusually warm winter has devastated its annual harvest. Mark Strassman investigates how farmers are planning to adapt to the changing weather. This is my great-grandfather's farm. Lawton Pearson's family farm has grown peaches for more than a century. But this year's harvest? the worst in his lifetime. You've got peaches here, and that variety has nothing. Not one? Not, not a single peach. Uh, that's the way 95% of the farm looks. His 1,500-acre peach crop, nearly a total loss. You always hold on to hope until it hits you in the face that there's nothing here. It sounds like the different stages of grief. That is pretty much right. I mean, it died, they all died. They're all my buddies. They all died, and now i got to deal with it. <laughs> Pearson's losing an annual challenge. It's something called chill hours. His Georgia peaches, always a diva fruit, generally need 850 hours under 45 degrees Fahrenheit to blossom. This year's crop, with climate change, about 700 chill hours. And why aren't you just willing to say, okay, it's a one-off? I'm hoping I can say that. I want to say that, but we are 20% off since 2016. A warm winter plus back-to-back -back devastating frosts 
that killed off the early blooms. At Atlanta's Silver Skillet restaurant, owner Teresa Breckenridge says the cost of fresh peaches has tripled. I can't afford the peaches right now, and the ones that you would buy, even if you could afford them, they're just not good. And a restaurant's peach cobbler, they've had to switch to canned peaches. There's nothing better than fresh, but you just have to have a plan B. With a changing climate, Georgia farmers are searching for their own plan B. And it could look like this. Each one of these is actually a, a, a pit from the fruit that we harvest from a cross that we made. At the University of Georgia, Dario Chavez tries to breed a more resilient peach. His team's matchmaking slivers from the pits of different varieties. Selection criteria, size, color, and especially taste. So some of these are hybrids with material from Florida. But all good breeding takes time, and Georgia is running out. It actually it takes decades. The short answer, you're working on it. Yeah, we're, we're, we're working on it. Continuing to grow peaches, it's potentially a risk. Yeah, it, it is potentially a risk. You know, we can't adapt without new varieties. But the number one qualification to be a Georgia peach is how it eats. I don't care how pretty it is or how tough it is or if it's, a, you know, if it's bulletproof, if it doesn't eat well, I'm out of business either way. In all his unfruited trees, those were killed but they didn't have the decency to fall off, they just sat there. <laughs> Lawton Pearson worries about his future in peach farming. If we are unable to continue to make peaches consistently, it, it, you really start to question whether this is a viable enterprise. A challenge both economic and existential. Georgia, the no peach state. From farmland in the south to providing fresh produce on Chicago's south side, an organization in the Windy City is offering a unique farm-to-table service to families in need. CBS News Chicago's Noel Brennan introduces us to the Fresh Food Pharmacy. Hi, Miss and Mr. Liddell. How are you? At this drive-thru. Can you just pull up a little bit more for me? The food isn't fast, but the customers... Hi how you doing? Are speedy. I busted my hump to get here quick. <laughs> Adriana Flalo knows farm to table is worth a wait. Waiting for my time to come up there and get me fresh vegetables and fresh fruit. I hope to pick up something fresh and delicious that I can cook with. She lives on the south side of Chicago. We are kind of like in a food desert. And leaves her neighborhood to find fresh produce. Food packaged inside Bethany Lutheran Church is close to home. Quick, convenient. And her hospital. Today, I'm at the food pharmacy. Dr. Julie Taylor with Advocate Trinity Hospital prescribes fresh food. And I can see the benefits based on their laboratory testing. And Advocate Healthcare delivers. We are looking at uh, green curly kale that was harvested yesterday. Chris Cubberly is manager of the Smart Farm a two-acre farm at Advocate Good Shepherd Hospital in North Suburban Barrington. About 60 types of vegetables, about 140 varieties of those vegetables. Food grown at a hospital on the north side serves patients at a hospital on the south side. Thank you, have a good one. Advocate not only produces the food, but we're also the ones that are distributing the food to the needy. It's coming straight from the farm. Regardless of where you live or who you are, you should have as much fresh, food variety available to you as possible. It's so fresh, it's still dripping with water. <laughs> the food at the drive through is far from fast. Lettuce, three different types of lettuce, right? Three different types of lettuce. It's exactly what the doctor ordered. Thank you. Ahead, how a so-called landscaping practice, that's right, landscaping, is supporting the growing solar industry. That story is next. We close our show blending tech with tradition. Solar panels populate vast spans of America's idyllic farmland, most of which still remain suitable for growing crops and grazing animals. Dana Jacobson shows us the harmonious economic and environmental relationship between sheep and solar. You ready, Reg? Away to me. It is a Border Collie's dream come true. Six acres of land, calling for Reggie to do what she was born to do. Good girl, good girl, Anna. Get up, bitch. Get up, up. Herding a flock of 32 sheep 
under the watchful eye of her owner. Good girl, good girl. Hi, sheep. Dan Finnegan. One well-trained border collie like Reggie is worth five full-time employees. Wow. Between the sheep and the dog, I'm just a driver. Here we go. Dan is more than just a driver. He's a third generation sheep farmer in southeastern Massachusetts. And while this isn't his family farm, it is Dan, Reggie, and the flock's office for the day. Together, they make up Solar Shepherd, working with large energy companies across the U.S. using the sheep to graze sites like this one, which hosts solar arrays. In Dan's words, they're in the landscaping business. Did people think you were crazy or at not? At the very beginning, at yeah. the very beginning, the conversations were centered around, you, you'd like to do what on our solar array? Yeah. Now that's not so much the case. Good girl, lie down. Why do you think it's been embraced so easily now, or at least so well now? Well, first and foremost, the sheep do a great job. Excellent workers. They, they're wonderful <laughs> workers. They do a great job of managing the vegetation on the solar array. They fit underneath the solar panels. The old-fashioned way of managing these sites would be to come in with a crew of five or eight guys on zero-turn mowers with the bulk of their time spent running weed whackers underneath the solar panels to get all that vegetation that grows under there. You know, a site like this, you'd probably send an eight-man crew for three days each time they mow it, at least three or four times a year. Time and money. Time and money. There's also the environmental impact. According to a recent study, if all sheep in the U.S. were shifted to agrosolar farms, the reduction in carbon emissions would be the same as removing 117,000 cars from the road. This field, which Solar Shepherd grazes, is one of 30 owned and operated by National Grid, responsible for providing power to more than 20 million customers in the Northeast. This brings energy into the grid. Steve Werner is the president for National Grid New England. What was it about agrisolar that attracted National Grid? It's an interesting solution to a problem that we have, right? So we, we installed large scale solar for residents of Massachusetts. We need to maintain the vegetation, the grass that grows on those properties. We came across this idea and said, hey, this is a win-win. It's cost effective. It's environmentally responsible, it's friendly to the neighbors, and this is just another example of how an area that was agricultural use still can be and also be a generator. Those stacked benefits from solar grazing, especially when it comes to the environment, are exceeding expectations according to Stacy Peterson. You know, we're seeing sometimes a threefold increase in pollinators. We're seeing three times the amount of birds and bees, bats, butterflies. She's the energy program director at NCAT's AgriSolar Clearinghouse, a government funded information hub for all things AgriSolar. How much has this industry grown in the last five to 10 years? So much, this is taking off all across the country and all across the world really. We're there to help you figure out what's best for your area and connect you with the right people that might help you do this if you want this at your farm or if you want this in your community. Solar grazing is just one of many in the agri-solar sphere. On solar sites nationwide, there are pollinators and beekeeping, crops grown, cattle raised, even fish farmed. Peterson says the opportunities appear endless. So this is gonna be a game changer in being able to move forward sustainably. People may not see agriculture and solar as fitting together naturally. Why would you say that they maybe do? I think that it is another crop. They're harvesting the sun again. They are providing the crop of energy. And they're doing that in a way that they can sustain their farm. I'm talking to farmers that they're able to pay for their farm for generations. They look at this as a way to be a good steward of the land. It does not come in with a mini mall. It doesn't come in with a residential development. This is something that can be returned completely to agricultural lands. And with the number and size of farms in the U.S. steadily declining over the last 15 years. Hey, Lou. Rich, that Lou here. That may be the relief many have been looking hey. for. Hello. It certainly has been for Dan Finnegan and Reggie. Without this solar operation and the added pasture it brings us, we wouldn't have a sustainable farm. We need this. And I think there are a lot of other farmers in that same boat. 
when you think about how many animals you need to produce to produce a living, particularly in, in the Northeast here, it takes a lot of acreage to yeah. do that. So the, the 100 acres of solar pasture we have under management, that makes our farm sustainable. If we didn't have that, we, we wouldn't be able to, to continue. So we're producing food, fiber, and energy all from the same acre of land. It's a smarter way to use this land. For more stories like these and live coverage of breaking news 24-7, stream us right here on CBS News. I'm Michelle Miller. Thank you for watching Eye on America.